Good morning. My name is Don Michaelman, and this is the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Uh, I call to order our June 9th, 2022 public hearing of the City of Prescott Planning Commission. Would like to have the commissioners introduce themselves, and Stan, would you like to lead off? Sure. Good morning, Stan Galagoski. Uh, good morning, Tom Hutchison. Ted Gamboji. Susan Graham. Butch Tracy. We have council member Rusing with us on that. Staff members will introduce themselves as they come up and make presentations on that. Uh, we have six members present. We may have a seventh one joining us by Zoom, but we have six present, and we'll take a majority vote to pass a motion. And this is an open public hearing and is being tape recorded and videotaped by the city. The proceedings are being televised by representatives of the public media, the public, local cable and or radio stations, and may also be rebroadcast. As some of the individuals may be attending this meeting remotely, all parties wishing to be heard, including commission members, are required to state their name prior to speaking in order to ensure accurate minutes. Members of the public, when called upon, are required to state their name and address for the record so that we may know, know who is speaking and be able to contact them at a later date if necessary. And also, if you could check your cell phones to make sure it's off or muted, would appreciate that. First item is the approval of the minutes from May 12, 2022. Are there any corrections? If no corrections, is there a motion for on the, concerning the minutes? This is Stan Galagoski. I move to approve the minutes. Yeah, Butch Tracy, I second it. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If none, Kaylee, would you call the roll? Yes. Butch Tracy. Approve. Thomas Hutchison. Uh, approve. Susan Graham. Was that that day? Okay, I'll note that. Uh, Stan Goligoski? Approved. Ted Gamboji? Approved. Don Michaelman? Approved. The motion passes 5 0. Okay. Next, we have a discussion on a review of site plans for water service agreements. Brent, you doing this? I am. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, good to see you this morning. We wanted to do a little bit of explanation before we started with the first item, which will be presented by Tammy, our community planner. Site plan review is found in the uh, Land Development Code at 9.8.4. It is an option for the community development director to trigger a site plan review, and the typical projects would be um, larger multifamily projects and or commercial. Site plan review was opted uh, into the water policy that was recently updated. Our water policy went into effect on April 26th of this year. And if you haven't reviewed that, I would, um, I would highly recommend it just as a matter of understanding how the city is approaching uh, water and water service applications. One of the attachments to the water policy is attachment five. It outlines the process for requesting um, water from the city. And as a part of that process, the site plan review in, found in the land development code as an existing code option um, is being made a requirement. So what you're seeing today in the first item, the first actual request, is going to be a site plan review of an existing uh, multifamily project that is looking to expand. We just wanted to provide you know, some background for the basis for seeing these site plans. The site plan typically, uh, before being included in the water policy, would be triggered for, again, large multifamily or complex commercial projects to make sure that site plan criteria is being met. So there are a number of items that need to be shown on a site plan. Those are included in 9.8.4. The criteria for site plan is found at 9.8.5 and includes such things as um, lot and setback requirements, public utility placement, landscaping, screening buffers, uh, parking requirements, signage and traffic control, and things like um, garbage bin placement and noise and odor uh, control. So 
basically the elements that go into a project that um, can benefit quality of life in, a, in a, either a commercial uh, project or multifamily project. And those elements that we find to be base requirements for good planning projects at that level. So we wanted to provide that information to you first. If you have any questions, please let us know. Um, but if not, Tammy will proceed with the first item. Do we have questions for Brent? I do. This is Don Michaelman. We are just reviewing the site plan. We are not approving usage of the water. That's correct. Just you are sure. simply looking at the land use elements of the project. Okay. That review is required as a part of an application for water. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Bryn, what was the rationale for uh, mandatorily tying these two together? Um, Public review and transparency, I think, was a primary component of that. And also just um, being good stewards of our water um, means that these larger projects really require more scrutiny. I think that's the simple answer. Other questions? OK. No other questions? With All that, right. I'll turn it over to Tammy. Before Tammy starts, I want to acknowledge that Council Member Montoya has joined us, too. Good to see you there. Tammy. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Commission. Tammy DeWitt, Community Planner with the City of Pres 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 Prescott. So like uh, Bern stated, this is our first uh, site plan review before you. Like I said, the only reason this is becoming before you is because it is a, a multifamily project, usually um, eight or more units or over eight units, and uh, large co and commercial projects. New commercial projects will be coming before you for site plan reviews. This is an expansion of existing uh, apartment complex, and so it triggered the review process for this type of application to come before you. So the request before you, it is an existing um, apartment complex. They are wanting to kind of modernize it. They're kind of old buildings. They're mostly built during the 1970s. The one was built in 1986. But basically, they're um, in the process of de um, uh, demolishing eight of the existing apartment units, the clubhouse and the pool, and they're going to construct 90 new dwelling units, so there'll be 120 dwelling units on site with a new clubhouse and pool, and then um, they will also have to combine the parcels, um, which they were told that, through an administrative process. Um, and like Bryn stated, that this is being brought before you as part of the new water policy. Um, the intent of the site plan review is to ensure that all developments have functional, well-designed, and user-oriented special requirements. Tammy, yes. Tammy is, is this part of the historic district? No. It's not. It's outside of that? Correct. So for this project, we have two parcels here. We have this parcel here, which is zoned business general, and then we have this parcel here, which is zoned multifamily high density. And there was a question that came up about the height. So in the business general, you're allowed a 50-foot maximum height for any structures, and then in the multifamily high, they're allowed a uh, maximum height of 35 feet, which is typical for residential. And all the structures on the site plan, and, and yet we're in your packets, and the elevations, they all are 35 feet that meet the height requirement. Requirements. So there's no other um, approvals that would be required for any height exemptions. Tammy, could you indicate north and south on that? North is up, south down, okay. east, west. Ooh. Ah, it's a little touchy this morning. Okay. So part of the site plan review criteria, things that we were looking at, and then this was also sent out to all our reviewing agencies. Um, they did have to fix a couple of things to address some fire concerns for um, parking and, ac and, um, and uh, access to the buildings. But otherwise, all this development criteria was ripped out by all our reviewing agencies. The building lot and setback requirements, they comply with. The circulation, um, they apply, uh, comply with. There's no concerns from public works or from the fire department. They have landscaping. Um, screening and buffering is not required because it is multifamily uh, zoning. There's other multifamily projects, and it's adjacent to commercial zoning, too. Outdoor lighting, they'll have to meet all our sky requirements and they'll be reviewed at permitting uh, parking and maneuvering areas to meet our our parking requirements and the access is through an existing main street so there's no concerns with any of that so here's the imagery of the property um, these this is all part of this complex here 
So these are going to remain. These are, this is all being taken out. And then this is where some of the new buildings are going. Tammy? Yes. Uh, a question I had, I, uh, I thought of the applicant, but since you started with it, uh, you mentioned there are units that are taken out. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the written word says eight units. I can't seem to add up eight units. So could you be more specific as to what's getting taken out besides the clubhouse? And these, the these structures right in here, this area right here. Not all four of them. Not all four of them. And I'll let the applicant, I have another picture that kind of shows it better. Which, so this is the existing apartments that are there that were built in the 1970s and then one in 1986. So this was provided by the applicant yesterday. So this kind of shows, so this one is going to remain and these are going to remain. North is this way. So, and then these are all the new buildings, the new pool and clubhouse. So this one will be remaining. So if we go back to this picture, it looks like that one. Is that correct? No? I'll go back to that no. last one. No, which one of these buildings? Is it this one that's staying? It's kind of hard. Okay. That one's staying. You got a better drawing in a, a few slides, I think, right? No. So this one's remaining. These are remaining. And the rest is getting demolished here. So. So this is what was provided. Oops, gosh, this seems been there we go. So this kind of gives you there's um, existing trees that remain here for for landscaping, and here too, and then the rest of it's already all buffered and existing. So this is the site plan that was provided. So yeah, this one's remaining. These are remaining. And the other one up there is remaining too. Sorry, I'm trying to get the right there. Right there. Okay, so this one's remaining, this one's remaining, and then the rest were um, getting upgraded with a new clubhouse and pool. And this way is north. <laughs> and so the elevations that were provided, they do meet all the height requirements. Um, FIRE did not have any concerns with access to these buildings. They'll have to meet all um, code requirements for that. And then they are three-story structures. They'll be staggered with the elevation. And they're all meeting the 35 height. And we do have Tom Riley now. Give him a minute. Okay. So these are all meeting our height requirements for that zoning district. And then um, the applicant did provide some color renderings of what the buildings will look like that were part of your packet. Oops. Yeah, I'm just having some technical issues today. There we go. So that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, um, the applicant is here to answer any questions. And Before we go to questions on that, uh, let me officially introduce this item. This is Site 22-001, Site Plan Review to Demolish Eight Apartment Units, Clubhouse, and a Pool, and Build 90 New Units for a Total of 120 Dwelling Units, Clubhouse, and Pool on Approximately 6.76 Acres, Zoning BG Business General and MFH Multifamily High Density, Parcel Number 109-15-015B and 109-15-019C at 301 South Cortez, Property Owner Cortez Circle Development LLC. Applicant is Stroll, did I pronounce that right, Stroll? Of architects? Stroll. Stroll. Architects. Okay. Sorry for not getting that ahead of time. We'll do better the next one there. Don, one, one addendum to that. I think that the deck we have incorrectly specifies uh, the lots. I think instead of um, it should be lot 015C, not 019C. No, there's two separate parcels. I understand that. But if you look at the, at the uh, site plan, it specifically shows that the two lots as B and C, not 15 and 19. They're both 015. So that's a, it's a question. Are we, have we, in fact, 
mislabeled? We will verify that before it goes to city council, but we did check that before advertising as part of the application. Are you seeing that? Those are tax parcel numbers. It has nothing to do with the address or anything. Wow. Okay. Questions for Tammy? Oh uh, yeah. Tammy, could you identify the front lot line for me? The front is where the access comes in. And then these will all be sides, rear. So this is an irregular lot? Yes. Yeah? Yes. And, and so we're, We we're, have two separate parcels here. They are gonna have to combine them. So, and then, but the, 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 where the road comes in, that's the, the, that's the front. And it meets all the setback requirements that was reviewed as part of the site plan review. So, so where is the front lot line? Drop with the... Right here. That's on Cortez. Yes. Where Cortez comes in. This is north. north. Course comes, Cortez comes in right here. So okay, this north so property line, that's the front. So building J, which is right by your little red hand there, mm -hmm. what, is, what is the front setback for that building? For multifamily high is... Well, I, know what, I know what it should be. I just wonder what that... I can't read that... Uh, and I can't zoom into the, right now up to this, but this was all reviewed and it meets all our development criteria. Well, I, that's my question. It needs to be a 20 foot setback according to the land development code. Mm -hmm. Is that a 20 foot setback? Yes. Yes, it shows the setback lines right there. I believe we have the architect here. Tom, would you like to yeah, let's have him verify? Commissioners, before he talks, just one easy thing to figure our setbacks for multifamily, if you look at dimensions of the parking spaces, they're 19 feet deep. So a parking space equals a 20-foot setback. Yeah. So that, yeah, so that line right here, that's the 20-foot. Oh, right, 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 right there, there's a dimension right there. Can I have the architect tell me what that number is? 20 feet. Please introduce yourself, sir. Sorry. Oh. Name and address. Uh, good morning. My name is Doug Stroh. I uh, founded Stroh Architecture in 1992, and I appreciate being in front of this distinguished group. So I'm here to answer any questions, and um, also give you a little summary if, if when you're ready for that. So, where are we? so in the back, so okay. here, here's the setback line right there. So that's what they show here. These, this line right here, those are the setback lines. It shows all the buildings within that setback, the setbacks. Oh, I'm, I'm satisfied that if, if, if you tell me that's 20 feet, I'm, I'm good with that. Absolutely. Um, I just don't see Tem that on the, on the drawing, that's all. As Timmy was saying, we, we meet all the setbacks. Um, she didn't tell you the truth about the height, though. The buildings are actually 34 foot 6 inches. So... <laughs> Just to be, you know, clear. <laughs> they meet the 35-foot requirement. <laughs> so, um, in summary, our uh, our client Art Hassan apologizes for not being able to be here. He had other commitments, but um, you know, the existing buildings are in need of TLC, and um, we want it. He wanted to get rid of two of the buildings in the clubhouse and modernize those particular footprints, which we're showing, which we're doing. Um, we have a uh, 90 new units, and we're keeping 30 of the existing units. So we have 120 new units in total per the density and the, um, uh, the city requirements. We are allowed to have 200 units, so we're only at 120. So our open space and density far exceeds the requirements which um, which makes it an even better project. The, um, the project is walkable from downtown, so it's, it's, um, it's only about five blocks from right here, just right up Cortez, and it's about a three-minute bicycle to the courthouse. So I, I think it's a, a really a good example of a, a poster child infill project. 
And um, currently, even in the conditions those apartments are in, the owner has a waiting list of 50 people. So uh, I think that um, with this site, with remodeling and um, modernizing everything, um, they're gonna fill up right away. You might ask, um, what about those people in the eight units? Uh, the owner is planning on uh, phasing these, uh, the new project in, so uh, if it's 50-50 or whatever, the first phase will obviously have um, uh, more than eight units. So once that is done and we get the certificate of occupancy, um, then he is going to, uh, hopefully all the tenants will stay and uh, move into the new building. And um, so we're not throwing anybody out in the street. Um, the other plan for this is uh, um, we are going to remodel all of the buildings, all the existing buildings. They, they all need it. And um, so the plan is to set up a couple of the apartments, probably furnish them, move the tenants out one at a time, refur re, uh, refurb their, uh, their apartments, and they can move back in. Or they can choose to uh, move into a new unit too. So um, uh, Art is, is very conscious of his tenants. They've been there long term. And um, it's, it's more of a family type um, apartment complex, a lot of kids. And so that's what his target's gonna continue to be. Uh, we are building a new swimming pool. Um, the, uh, the spa shown in the corner of that swimming pool is not quite accurate, it'll be separate. Um, we want a rectangular pool so that we can have a, a cover on a track. You push a button and it covers the pool up uh, when the, um, the, the pool is not open. And um, that way it'll eliminate all evaporation. So we're gonna uh, minimize the water that we use. It's kind of like a, a, a splash pad, which he considered, but there's gonna be a lot of adults that like to lounge in the pool and uh, play with their kids. Uh, the splash pads, they evaporate a lot of water during the day also. And just like this, at night all the water goes into a tank, so it eliminates the evaporation. So it's very similar, and uh, I think it'll be very popular with our climate getting warmer and warmer. So the clubhouse will also have all the typical other amenities, workout areas, meeting rooms. It'll have like an internet cafe. So people working from their units will have some place to uh, go and not be hanging out in their, their bedroom doing business. Um, so uh, we meet all the parking requirements and um, it's a mixture of one, two and three bedrooms. Um, the three being probably more likely for um, families or you know younger folks that share an apartment to keep the cost down. So uh, we think we have a, um, a really nice project. We're keeping the existing trees. If you look up there to the left, existing trees to remain, that too is part of our property. And it's a very, it's a steep hill that goes up to it. And then it's kind of an, uh, an island up there uh, with trees and everything. But we decided not to disturb that, and there's also a, uh, a lot of trees down in the lower or in the upper right-hand corner on this image, which is the northwest corner. So we're um, we have a lot of indigenous trees around the rest of the site. So it's and once again, it's 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 uh, you can coast on your bicycle to downtown in a few minutes. So um, I think it uh, meets all the uh, all the criteria, all the all the checks, all the boxes. So um, we uh, appreciate your consideration and hopefully you'll see it the same way that we do. So I'm here to answer any other questions that you all might have. Questions for the applicant? Yeah, I've got a couple more. Uh, could you tell us where, where the kids are gonna play and where the dogs are gonna do their business and all that stuff? I, I see buildings and, and places for cars to play park, but I don't see I don't see a playground or any of that stuff. What? On these preliminary designs, that doesn't, it isn't clearly shown, you know, around the pool area is one of them, but we're gonna have some other playground areas and uh, three dog parks also, and a total of uh, uh, two play areas. Where, where would you put that stuff? 
that would typically be near the clubhouse, and then the, the uh, older existing area has a lot of open space. We plan on developing that, and we have a little bit of an area up in the um, northwest corner also. So, so, so that if you if you look at apartments, you see a lot of stuff that people have, their grills and all that. There'll, there'll be patios and and uh, places for stuff like that. Yes, all all the uh, the new buildings have um, have uh, decks or or patios mm -hmm. if you're on the first floor, and the uh, the existing ones are. Um, not quite as well laid out, but during the remodeling process, which would be a, a different, you know, future submittal, depending on the intensity of the remodel, that would be uh, uh, delineated much better. Mm -hmm. Dad? Uh, there, there's another little pocket park up there between buildings um, G and... Uh, Oh, uh, the building to the right of that, is that an A? I can't even read it either. <laughs> but um, it shows a ramada and some trees and stuff. Is this the map of the new development? The back? The map. Is this the map of the what's going to be there, not what's there now? Okay, this is what's going to be. Yes. Yeah, the only difference is that uh, the two buildings that Tammy was describing earlier that are being uh, demolished. Now, could, that's, that's my question. I'm going to ask the question, then I'm going to turn around and look at the bigger map. So would you point out those two buildings again? Yes. Are you asking which ones are getting demolished? Yes. Okay, we'll go back to the imagery. So right there, that building and the next building to the upper left of it, those two buildings are going away, and the, the very end of the building that Tammy has the uh, uh, pointer on, not that one, but the one you're on, Tammy, the end of that building the, uh, is actually the clubhouse, which is <laughs> hardly existent, and then, of course, the old swimming pool and the old pumps and everything else. So uh, that uh, will be the pool and everything, that entire long building, and the other one uh, down uh, below that are all going to be demolished well, once. Those, those two buildings add up to eight units? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, you, you talk about coasting to downtown on your bicycle, but you never mention anything about climbing the hill back up. <laughs> <laughs> my wife tells me the same thing. We live uphill from my office. Why don't you ride your bike? How am I going to get back home? But um, I recommend you'll have e to get an e-bike, I guess. That's right. <laughs> Other it's always questions? harder to get home, you know. <laughs> uh, Tom Riley, do you have any questions? I take that as probably not. Uh, no, I do not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All righty. Um, I have a couple questions, sir. I would imagine in the new buildings you're building, you're going to put in low-flow water devices? Absolutely. I forgot to uh, mention that. But, yes, these will all be designed to Energy Star standards, which include Energy Star appliances, which like includes dishwashers that are low water use, washing machines, and um, uh, shower heads. And uh, everything in the, uh, the apartments will be low water use. The toilets especially will be one gallon flushers. And when you do the remodel of the existing building, same things are going to occur there too? I would assume so, but we haven't hardly gotten into that with the client yet. It's like we're just you know, doing this step first, but um, I can't imagine him not doing that. Okay. That um, you know, makes the units more affordable. And uh, obviously we, we have a... Uh, a water concern and our landscaping will reflect that too. It will meet all of the uh, planting criteria listed in the city. All right. That was my next question about landscaping making it low usage also. Yes, yeah. Um, there will be a lot of grass on site. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, there won't be any grass. So it will all be uh, low water use type landscaping. Okay, so I imagine the play area is going to be like the rubber things that the kids... Yes. Want. Okay. Rubber right. or chips. All right. Mm -hmm. Other questions for the applicant? Um, regarding building L and K side setback. Okay. I, again, I can't read those numbers, but it looks like we're right up against that alley. 
But we're 20 foot from that property line. I, no, that's a seven foot prop. Uh, so we're so we're seven feet from the building wall to the alley. From the property line, yes, and there will be some retaining retaining walls there too, and uh, then you have the the, the entire alley. So it's. Um, and it's elevated. The views from those three buildings along the um, west side are are fantastic. You have the Thumb Butte and oh, those I, areas. I, I've been over there, and the view is looking at an alley and a bunch of people that use that as a driveway. Look up. <laughs> when you look down, that's what you're going to see. Well, on the first floor. Okay, so, so are there any balconies in the back? Yes. So basically that balcony uh, in, uh, intrudes into that seven feet. How, how big are the balconies? The balconies do not intrude into the second, the uh, the setback. I know they're not part of the setback equation, but in fact, the living space on that balcony is using up some of that seven feet. No, no, no. no, no the building has to be seven feet from the property line, and that includes the includes the includes decks. the patio. Hmm? So the patio, it's or the or the. Could you show them that rear yeah. rendering, please, Tammy. Give it a second. So you can see there's the rear of the building you're talking about. Okay. And um, the, the brown tall uh, columns are the storage rooms for the units. And uh, the setback begins there. Good. So Good. The, the decks right and everything together. are beyond the seven feet. That's better. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you all. Yeah, I have one more. <laughs> I, can. I know you limited me to 34 seconds. Yeah. But, but uh, <laughs> um, regarding the, the incremental piece of road that's been added uh, along the your, The south end? The south end, yes. That loop? That loop. What do you see happening with the cars dumping into Cortez, the continuation of Contor uh, Cortez Street? Have you got a choke point there? Well, the, the traffic, you know, in, within an apartment complex shouldn't be much of an issue at all. That uh, wraparound drive was uh, dictated by the fire department. They wanted access to uh, the back side of that building. And of course, the big hill is right to the left of that, right to the south. But um, out people that don't live here, I don't think many of the people just go down Cortez and drive through the apartment complex. So I, I um, hear your concern, but I, I don't think it's, it's going to be much of an issue. It's a, you know, it's quiet. There's typical apartments, and people start pouring out between 7 and 9, but it, it shouldn't be a, a big deal at all. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Again, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Is there a motion concerning this agenda item? Is there one from the public? Oops, excuse me. Sorry about that. Any comments from the public? Want to come up, make a presentation, ask questions? Hearing none on that. Is there a motion to be made? I have one question for Tammy, if I can. Go ahead, Tom. Tammy, does the address determine the front property line? No. No, not necessarily. Oh, it's, where the, it's where the road comes in, so that north property line is the front, and the south property line would be the rear, which is consistent with any development. Now, Coach. In motion. Mr. Chair, I move to recommend approval of site plan SITE 22-001 Cortez Circle Apartments. We have a second. motion. Is there a second? Second. That's Tom Riley. All right, motion seconded. Further discussion? Kaylee, would you call? Butch Tracy. I would approve. Tom Riley? Approve. Tom Hutchison? I approve. Susan Graham? Appro approve. Stan Goligoski? Approve. Ted Gamboji? Approved.
Don Michaelman. Approve. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next item on the agenda is PLN 21-007, preliminary plat of South Ranch at Deep Well subdivisions, units one, two, and three, Safety. zoning special plan communities, SPC, property owner James Deep Well Ranches, LLC, and APN 102-05-036A. George. Thank you, sir. Um, one correction, in the time between the submittal of the project to us and today, the ownership has changed to Ash Dorn Development. So the James Depot Ranch uh, sale has gone through to Ash Dorn. That has not been reflected yet in county records and the application is still from the original um, ownership. It doesn't really change what we're doing today. The look is at the preliminary plat proposal for South Ranch um, for Depot Ranches. Property is located in the vicinity of the airport, north of Pioneer Parkway and west of Willow Creek Road in its new alignment, it is far enough west of Willow Creek Road that there are two road extensions that will provide access to the property, and I'll show you those when I get to the actual plat map itself. The property is within the <coughs> Deepwell Master Plan's zoning. The Special Plan Communities, SPC zoning, was put in place with the Deepwell Master Plan to allow the um, layered land use groups that are part of that master plan to control the uses within it. Uh, it required the SPC zoning in order to use that concept. The proposal before you today is phases one, two, and three, or they're calling them units one, two, and three, um, within South Ranch. There could be uh, future South Ranch <coughs> phase two that would contain more units, and we'll see those at some point um, if the development proceeds the way it appears to be proceeding. 87.3 acres, 359 lots are proposed. That's an average of 4.1 dwelling units per acre. Um, it is within impact zone six, but there are other airport related impacts which we'll get into in a couple of moments. Um, we've invited the airport director, Dr. Robin Sabata, to come and talk to you about those concerns. So in a couple of minutes, we will get to those and um, I'll turn it over to her for that. Uh, and again, I, I note that Ash Dorn Development is the property owner now. The property is proposed to be accessed, the development is proposed to be accessed from two directions, from the south through Jenna Lane. Uh, Jenna Lane is the main gray area. Let me see if I can actually point to it. So this roadway, <coughs> which is in a, an engineering permit for construction of that roadway now. That engineering permit will allow the construction from Willow Creek Road all the way through this subdivision up to James Lane, which is this roadway. This is an extension of James Lane. And I, again, on the plat itself, it'll be a little bit clearer what these roads connect to. Just a little bit closer view of the north end of it, you can see the lot arrangement is very similar to the other subdivisions in Deepwell Ranch that we've seen so far, mostly Westwood and Antelope Crossings, which they've changed the name of. I can't remember what that is. Uh, but as you can see, the lot's typical. Um, the one big difference here that we didn't see in most of the other subdivisions are the number of cul-de-sacs. In this case, these cul-de-sacs along this western boundary are because this is also an ownership boundary. So this area is within one ownership and future connectivity to this area may be problematic because it's a different owner and different development circumstances. Back to, let me step back just a moment. This area is actually belongs, excuse me, this area actually is owned by the state land department. So this is, state ownership, and this is Deepwell Ranch ownership, um, and now Ash Dorn ownership in this area. Actually can show you a little bit better. Jenna Lane comes off here and goes through, makes a loop up and connects with this road, which is James Lane. And James Lane will extend through to uh, the state land to provide for future connectivity when that eventually sells and develops. 
And just to look at the south end of the subdivision, uh, again, the same situation, Jenna Lane extends around and it ultimately connects to Willow Creek Road. Here's Willow Creek Road. <laughs> There's James Lane. This portion of James Lane is not constructed yet. And this portion of Jenna Lane is not constructed yet. So that would have to be in place prior to final planning of this in order to provide access either this direction or this direction to the subdivision. It will require at least one of those connections and probably both to meet fire department requirements. So we would anticipate that extension occurring and the extension of Jenna Lane occurring prior to this being final platted and constructed. Those are important features to understand. To provide that access is a fire safety requirement as <coughs> well as a general circulation requirement of the city. Well, we don't want to create single points of access. We do allow for single points of access as temporaries if we know that a future second connection will occur. If you recall, Hidden Hill subdivision came before you uh, a few months ago. That Hidden Hill subdivision has a future connection to the north, west of that same state land piece that we were just looking at, um, to provide permanent dual access into the subdivision. It was approved temporarily and subject to that eventual road connection occurring. Again, we have the airport director here who's gonna go through a few slides with you to talk about some of the concerns the airport has due to its proximity to the main end of the runway. Most of our traffic to and from the airport come off of this runway and it's of importance. So I'm gonna turn it over to Robin to talk to you about this and then we'll come back and talk about potential actions by the commission. Robin, thank you for taking time to come talk to us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Good, good morning to everyone. I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak with each of you. Um, so uh, as you can see, this is the uh, proposed project area. Um, I've circled it. It isn't the exact outline of the project. It's to give you an idea. The darker orange represents high uh, number of flight tracks over the property, and this is a medium to high area for flight tracking that we're discussing. Just as a refresher, the uh, airport is the 18th busiest airport in the country as of last year. Um, not in terms of aircraft size, but in terms of aircraft operations, we are busier than San Francisco, Boston, JFK, LaGuardia. So as a result, um, you can expect that there's going to be a tremendous amount of overflight in this area. Um, when the airport does an analysis, we look at several items, safety in terms of the community itself and, and the flight and the occupants of an aircraft, compatibility, which is uh, looking at its compatibility with the community. We have federal compliance requirements. It's a contractual obligation to meet certain grant assurances, including land use compatibility and height and obstruction analysis. We have to assure that continued normal aircraft operations occur that includes the airline, the U.S. Forest Service, and our, gen, our very, very robust general aviation community. And then also we look at transparency and whether or not folks will have enough information to make an educated decision. So we have done an initial analysis of this property, and these are the additional um, analyses that we believe um, are needed. Um, the first one is there's additional airspace information needed. The FAA conducts a base, or I call it a basic, approach and departure airspace review. It's uh, sometimes referred to as a Form 7460. Um, the housing determinations have not yet been received. Some points were resubmitted as the applicant worked with the FAA. Um, it does not include, at least the current application or the points that were submitted do not include any proposed streets because streets themselves are calculated at the maximum height of a vehicle that's traversing. Any sort of traffic lights or community lighting, windmills if they're going to put in there, any type of vegetative growth or other future permitted objects such as antennas that may be permitted within the subdivision, also um, no points have been submitted on those. So we have no information back on that. And it's real important to note that while the FAA has one analysis, there is a layered set of analyses, many of them dictated by the FAA to users or to the airport that also have to be studied. And so, so in addition to 
to the base airspace and approach, um, approach and departure review. We need additional airspace analysis on future height controls for things like trees and antennas, drone operation over the property. Um, right now, the applicant is submitted for a maximum height of 23 feet. If a tree grows above that elevation, it could be a hazard even if in the original airspace review it wasn't considered a hazard. Protections may be addressed in the current easement that is with the property. We need to clarify that. Also, code protections are being discussed. And in fact, next week on June 14th, there will be a study session talking about an airport area overlay. And that will be something that will, that will be further addressed. There's an additional requirement that the airline ha has. It's called a one engine inoperative, or OEI, splay. It's a departure path that is, is required by the FAA. When the aircraft departs, it has to presume that an engine may go out. And as such, to be able to operate without hitting something. So that airline splay is actually more restrictive than the standard base splay for the FAA first one that I put up there. And so as a result, we need to confirm that splay location because I'll be showing you it's right along the edge of the property. And in fact, part of the property transcends into it right now, and it doesn't show the use at this time, so it is a concern. Um, we do have an independent airspace analysis that is going to hopefully be conducted if council approves on June 14th, the analysis to go forward. That analysis will take approximately six to eight weeks, and it will reconfirm the splay, the obstructions in the splay, and the airspace in the vicinity of this property and the other properties that are up there that you saw. Also, we're again looking at codifying the OEI and the display protection. That'll begin in a study session on June 14th while we look at updating our codes. Next, we need to look at the noise contours. Now, what this is, is this the cumulative impact of noise on communities. And you can see a little diagram of an older contour down here in the subject area. And it is possible part of the area does is overlaid by this noise contour. This represents a, what's called a 60 DNL. It's a noise level. Just to give you an idea, in a study done by the FAA about a year ago, if you lived within that zone, roughly half of the people would be um, significantly annoyed if they lived in that um, particular contour. And that is a concern because significantly annoyed people would then, or highly annoyed, I guess is the term they use, highly annoyed people generally would be in opposition to future development of the airport. And so that would be not consistent with our grant assurances to assure compatible land use in the vicinity. That contour update is underway. We expect draft contours this month. So we will be able to see the first new contours showing the 55 and 60 levels day and night average sound levels um, with regard to the airport. When the last set of contours were done out to that level, the airport only had about 230 or 240,000 total operations. Like I mentioned, we're up to 311,000 last year, and right now, based on the first four months of this year, it looks like we're going to be about 340,000, between 320 and 340,000 operations this year. That still doesn't hit our all-time high. The highest was actually achieved in the 1990s when we hit nearly 354,000 operations. So the, the fact is the airport has had highs and lows in its, in its uh, history. But the good news is those draft contours are due this month, and those draft contours are actually referenced in both our airport-specific area plan and on our land use plan as having certain land use restrictions that we should recommend with those. So here's the area above you. It is the general project area, which is here. This is the impact zones one through five. There is actually a sixth zone, which is the area right in here. This is zone four off the general aviation runway, which does appear to be within the project. This is the airline splay. So you see how it's swooping up? This is the airline splay as it's up and out for that one engine inoperative departure that's required by the FAA. And then this is zone four of what's called the impact zones. It's real important to note that impact zones are areas where historically the NTSB has found that there's a greater risk, risk of a crash in the close proximity to the airport. In fact, as you can see down here, mm -hmm. 85 or more aircraft impacts or accidents have occurred in the airport vicinity with several of them having occurred in Deepwell Ranch. And most recently, that was about <coughs> Uh, two and a half weeks ago, the latest impact was in this location right here. Um, and it was, um, this is referred to as zone three. 
The distance from the impact location that occurred a couple weeks ago to here is roughly 1,500 feet. That pilot on departure um, indicated that he had an engine failure. He had roughly 10 to 12 seconds to make a decision on where to land. Resultingly, what we need to understand is we need to better understand all of the Deep Well Ranch dedicated open space versus optional open space. We need to see where an aircraft has the ability to be able to have a problem and be able to land without hurting the occupants of the aircraft or <coughs> the people on the ground. Right now, according, if you look at all the layers of the Deep Well Ranch master plan, it does allow, for example, a daycare center to be right here. It does allow churches to be in this area right here. And in fact, where this impact zone is, a church is being proposed for this very location, and I'm going to be speaking on that issue later today. So the concern we have with this particular project is the project maps don't show all the impact zones. Zone four is missing from the general aviation runway on their maps. The project maps don't show the intended use for two tracks, track AA plus one other track that overlap the impact zones here for the OEI splay and zone four here. And there's a concern about the road transition that may be required into potential, potential areas. I'm showing you here our airport layout plan, which shows that these areas are targeted for acquisition, for approach protection for the airport. And as a result, if a road comes into here and it does from our airspace analysis appear that we need to drop the level of the roadway so the roadway itself is not an obstruction, I have questions about how this particular property that you're looking at right now will transition down with its roadway and with its homes right up to the edge of this area, how it will transition into this area with the, with the Jenna Lane. So that is something that we need to further study. Now this uh, property is within the airport influence area within Deepwell Ranch, both an easement and a fair notice disclosure is required. This is the requirement in our code for the requirement of an easement. Over here is the Deep Well Ranch easement and fairness disclosure notice, fair notice disclosure. And it states that the grantor agrees to include in all fair disclosure documents and in the CCNRs a notice reasonably similar to the form attached. It's about a one page description of the airport. Unfortunately, it appears that it's never been included in any of the CCNRs in prior Deep Well Ranch projects. There have been disclosures, but they're usually about a paragraph long and they say sort of generalized. This disclosure that's attached is much more specific to this airport, and we really do want to advocate for the right fair notice disclosure information to get out in the format that was agreed to. So for this project, we do need to see the CCNRs as well as the community and sales disclosure documents to assure that this is being met. We also want to know how future buyers, like second and third buyers, get this information, because if it's only transmitted in the sales office, what happens when the sales office goes? How will future renters get a fair notice um, notification? We've had people call us and say they're stuck in a 12-month lease, and they never even really realized they, they did it remotely, and they're, they can't get out of the lease. And so they'd like, we'd like them to have this fair notice notification. And then ultimately, that issue will be addressed in a possible code update. So in summary, the airport has several items underway right now to conduct further analysis, specifically with regard to this area and generally with regard to Deepwell Ranch. We would really like the additional time to complete the analysis, collect that data, and to be able to present that to our airport advisory committee, gain their comment, and also eventually prevent, present that information back to you. But it may take a while. You know, we are going to have to roll out these studies, and we're actively um, hoping to be able to accomplish that in as timely a manner as possible, because we are respectful of the landowners' rights as well. Thank you, Robin. Any questions for Robin? Robin, could you? I'm sorry, Susan. Go ahead. Um, the information that you have displayed here, does that show the um, future expansion of the Will runway? you speak into the microphone? You do. So, does, does that reflect the future expansion of the runways? Well, it's a good question. The runway is actually going to be expanded to the east. To some extent, that will obviously benefit individuals 
to the west, because if you take off starting further to the east, they may be higher when they get to this location. The concern we have right now is because this land has not been acquired. If there are any additional penetrations in there, then what happens is the runway length that we have calculated may not be adequate to be able to do what we're trying to do, which is extend the runway long enough so the air carrier can take off and fill all the seats. To give you an idea this week, the Los Angeles flight, because of our hot and high airport and our short runway, cannot sell 22 of the seats on every single Los Angeles departure this week. As we get further into the summer, it'll be 25 seats. That's half of the seats on the plane cannot be sold. If development in this area, including the notch that's shown on this particular project, which transcends into this area, cannot be protected, then the study that was based on this area having no additional obstructions may not be sufficient. We would set our runway extension back potentially two to three years, and the cost of extending that runway to accommodate for the additional penetrations down at this end and the weight that would have to be reduced for those penetrations could jeopardize the runway extension and the future air service in our community. Thank you. Ted? Robin, how long does the runway have to be in order for the planes to take off with a full load? We completed a study that was presented to City Council in 2020, and the recommended length is 11,000 feet. A cost-benefit analysis has to be conducted, and that cost-benefit analysis has to calculate the number of passengers, additional passengers you can gain from the additional runway length. However, if additional obstructions are penetrated down here, that affects the analysis because those obstructions can only be mitigated by reducing weight on the plane. The only way you can reduce weight on the plane to allow it to get the lift over additional obstructions is to reduce fuel, baggage, or people. And so we are at this point at a point where that has to be very clear that that area is either protected or we basically are set back a couple of years on the runway extension project and we may lose it altogether. Could you back up, let's go back through your slides. There's one I wanted to look at. Which one would you uh, like? Forward of that. I'm sorry, this one, right? I'm sorry, it's rolling fast. Let me just do it this way. Okay. That one. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was gonna ask of, between you and city staff if, if you could come back and, and accurately depict the lots we're looking at and then put your numbers in there that are, indicate sound Thank you. And the sound is the noise contours. The impacts for safety is another overlay. Yeah. Would you, and the sound ones won't be back till later this month, the, the revised. The impact ones we can show you now. Well, I should say with the geolocated CAD drawings, we, we can go ahead and superimpose the property. Thank we, you. Thank you. Tom? Uh, just, just a comment, Robin. My question to you would have been, does this development in any way jeopardize the future of, of the airport? And I think he answered that as a, as a yes, it does. Is that, is that correct? I believe it does. Yeah. Th thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Tom. And thank you, sir. Um, I do have a question uh, for Robin. Uh, Robin, there appears to be already some roadways, I think that might be Willow Creek Road, that is going through that blue area. Um, how do you mitigate impacts of that? Those impacts um, have been calculated in the runway study. So the idea of putting a roadway through the blue area is something that is possible as long as you mitigate the impacts of that roadway, correct? That, that is possible. That's one of the items that I had listed for future study, absolutely. And it can be mitigated two different ways for two different layers. Some layers allow something to be lit. Others layers don't, rec don't allow an obstruction at all. So there are ways to mitigate, but there are multiple layers that we have to look at. And you can take that road down so that it, 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 it itself doesn't become an obstruction. Which is particularly challenging at this end of the runway is the rising terrain. 
So something seems like it's not very high, but relative to the end of the runway where the obstruction is calculated to be an issue, it, it does, the rising train presents a significant problem as you go to the west. Could you try to enlighten me? Uh, obstructions on a roadway, would that be things like tractor trailers, uh, you know, things like that? I mean, are those what's considered obstructions on a roadway? Uh, anything, Light poles? Sure. Anything that normally traverses the roadway would be one analysis for the actual, what they call the transit or traverse way. Actual light poles or any other objects that would be used to light the roadway would be another. Yes. Okay, well, it sounds like and all that study has been taken into account with the roadways that are currently traversing that blue area, correct? No, that's why, according to the checklist that I have up here, we actually have not received any results from the initial base airspace re review. Some points uh, that, were that, submitted. That wasn't my question. I'm sorry, I didn't state my question clearly. The roadways that are currently tra uh, traversing the blue area, have those studies been done for the mitigation of those existing roadways? I don't know, that was prior to my arrival. Yeah, yeah, that was prior to my arrival. So those were factored into the runway extension study. So yes, they were. I don't know, it was prior to my arrival. Oh, okay. But we're and, looking to do that now. Has any, would any analysis that you do now include uh, those existing roadways to see if there's any mitigation that needs to take place there? Yes, that's part of the okay. airspace study that is going to be in front of council next week. Thank you. That I don't have any more questions for Robin, but I do have other questions, Mr. Chairman, when we're ready. Okay, Tom. Other question? Dan? Yeah, uh, thank you. Dr. Sabota, if you could go back to the uh, airport impact zone uh, slide again. Sure. So the, the splay that's, that you have up there, was that created because of the first phase of Deepwell Ranch? Did they veer it up to the north because of that? Is that, is that the purpose of that? because there are, is residential currently. Oh, the there. splay is actually developed using FAA guidance, but it's developed by the airline. And that's, that's the airline splay right there as they depart Prescott Regional Airport. It's associated with that particular aircraft, but we've looked at future aircraft that are going to be servicing it and the same splay would be used. In fact, even aircraft that divert here from other locations like Flagstaff have their own splay that they've used. So, in regards to what Deepwell Ranch did, um, or this particular project, you can see the project area skirts the edge of this. Right. But there are penetrations into it with a tab, or it, I showed you a tract, and over here there are penetrations in zone four. And this is not shown, this notch, which is the general aviation runway zone four. Is that answering your question? Yeah, I'm just curious if that, so we're seeing that development that's off to, will be off to the west with current residential there. Yeah, this um, is Pinion Oaks. That is Pinion Oaks, right. They are in zone four. Gotcha. So that was that splay kind of created because of that, that residential area? So the impact zones versus the splay. The splay was developed by the airline, and what it does is at, on takeoff, it is turning toward, what, toward what's called the Drake VOR. Mm. VOR stands for Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range Indication Station. It's kind of like the I knew uh, that. Yep. I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. It looks I like, did not. It looks like a bowling pin up in Chino Valley. <laughs> okay, and so it's going that direction because it gives a pilot a um, it avoids, it's called an obstacle rich environment. It avoid, avoids obstacles, goes up there, the pilot can try to fix things. The goal is to get back down and land safely. Mm -hmm. The impact zones on the other hand were developed back in 2011 as a land use compatibility plan really important element. And that particular item was adopted by city council in 2013. Um, so these, these impact zones have been around for quite some time. And they are developed using NTSB crash data. So it is an idea of where the majority of impacts are. Mm -hmm. So we like the word impact as opposed to crash, but this, you can see that's why they're referred to as impact zones. It isn't. Now they are blended with other information like those noise contours. So you, according to that plan, would be allowed to have, for example, housing with impact zones four, five, and six, so long as they're outside of the 55 DNL, mm -hmm. according to the guidance in that land use plan. Our airport specific area plan actually prohibits housing outside of zone 
zones one through five. I mean, sorry, prohibits inside zones one through five. It only allows it outside, but again, outside the 60 DNL. Mm -hmm. So part of this study and part of our code updates will to make sure that we have consistency and information to all people in the interest of transparency. Great, so, so kind of follow up to that too is if, let's say for instance, it is, we're currently dealing with a residential area that's being proposed. Does the FAA, does, do you perceive that uh, if it were zoned something different, if something else were to go in there, like a, a business industrial, whatever it might be, is that viewed more generously than, than a residential area around that area? Could it be, I mean, what would be a recommendation if it were to be developed some, some other means? It is a layered analysis. It looks at density. Because obviously, if there are fewer things to run into, more open space, that's really helpful. But particularly also in terms of compatibility. So we're looking at height. As we had said, these are all the things we have to look at in every project. It's safety in terms of those impact and crash zones, and community as well as airport. It's compatibility in the community in terms of noise and overflight. It's our federal requirement, uh, compliance requirements so that we don't have opposition for the future expansion of the airport. And we have to assure continued normal operations for the U.S. Forest Service, for the you know because if they have a problem on takeoff and they need to jettison a load of extinguishing agent, I certainly would not like it to happen on houses, daycare centers, churches. Um, so keeping an area and approach clear to be able to allow an occasional mishap to occur without hurting people would be. I think it's required by our grant assurances, but it's the right thing to do. Compatibility, that's the key word. Yeah, for, and then uh, transparency. If sure. ultimately they are going to be permitted, people mm. should know. Sure thing, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chairman? Tom. Thank you, sir. Um, I do have a question that came up. Stan raised this good question. And it seems as though that this particular area of development, of this area of impact from the airport, is going to potentially preclude development of most kinds in that area. Is, is that, I mean, we need to consider that. And if that happens, then it looks like uh, the city may be on the hook to be buying some, some land. And I'm wondering if the city is prepared for that. And Robin, have you had any conversations with uh, the, the city manager or anybody else with regards to the fact, you know, the city possibly requiring this land? Is, you know, even open space. Yes, and those are really good questions. The area that you see on the map on, do you, do you have access to, to the third slide? You see what you're showing. Okay, so do you see the area in blue? Yes, I do. That is the areas that are on our airport layout plan that are targeted for approach protection. This is land acquisition. The, when you have an airport layout plan approved by the FAA, it meets the requirements for um, reimbursement. Um, an approved airport layout plan doesn't guarantee reimbursement, but with the good fortune of having the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, there is approximately $3.3 million in that bill that we have ear targeted for um, assistance in acquisition of approaches in the airport vicinity, and this is one of the critical areas we feel needs to be protected, not only in the interest of the airport, but clearly in the interest of the community who would be highly impacted if they would be in that area from noise, from the potential for an accident. And we wanna make sure we do everything we can to mitigate that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the area to the east of that blue, you know, heading more towards the uh, runway itself, is why is that area not blue? It was perceived that that was originally protected. If you see a picture of the Deep Well Ranch master plan diagram, the concept, it shows up as largely all, well, all green in that area. It says open space, comma, civic. And what we found is that civic has a whole lot of buildings that you could put in that area. So that area now is under discussion as a possible area of acquisition because of the incompatible uses that could be permitted in there. But clearly, I don't think anybody wants to see a daycare center right here, do we? So I wouldn't send my kids there. 
<laughs> Other questions? Robin, we've been talking a lot about aircraft taking off. Yes. Those landing, are there any additional exposures there that we need to know about, or is there less challenges with landing aircraft versus taking off? You're so wise to point this out because the, the majority of times that there is a situation, it's in the act of takeoff and landing. It is when the aircraft is most vulnerable. I am showing you these particular areas. They are not exclusive to only landing or only departure. We did talk about the departure splay with regard to the airline because that's the regulated portion of the airline flight with regard to its one engine departure. The rest of this uniformly does apply to takeoffs and landings and the typical mishap area where these occur based on NTSB historic data. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions while well, Robin's here? Again, appreciate your taking time. We may ask you to come back again. Thank you, thank you. Concerning this uh, you know, item. George? Mr. Chairman, Robin gave away my surprise. Um, we, we are working on and have drafts of a potential change to our land development code that would actually incorporate the impact zones that Robin talked about into code so that they are more enforceable, more applicable as if they were zoning. They will become zoning. That's something that we're going to do a presentation to council, an introduction to council on, but you're going to be deeply involved in this. We're going to run these through because any amendment to the Land Development Code is something that requires Planning Commission review and recommendations. We're going to run these things through this body for a look all the way through the process. And the first look that we bring to you will be basically Airport Land Use 101. It'll be from the zoning perspective, from the airport perspective, what do we need to do in order to actually incorporate these things into a zoning code and why we need to incorporate them into a zoning code. So that's something that will probably start appearing in front of you in July is what I'm thinking. And we will start those off with a couple of learning sessions and then perhaps a specific text review to follow that. Okay. As you, I'm sure, gathered, just looking at those in the room and from Mr. Riley's question, he as well, there's a lot of outstanding questions left for the airport compatibility end of this development. And as a result of that, though, some of this information didn't come out at the time that we initially advertised this and agendized it. Because that information is now out and we know what needs to be done in order to resolve questions of the airport, whether or not it resolves the compatibility determination, we at least need to know the information and then can decide is it or isn't it compatible. Um, staff's recommendation is going to be that you defer action until those issues have been addressed. So uh, a motion to table indefinitely uh, or a motion to table until such time, as I've written up here, allows the airport and the applicant, the developer, time to get all of that data together, evaluate it to determine that it meets the requirements before we agendize it back for you. So you're not setting it out a month, you're setting it out until this is resolved. And that's our recommendation. Be happy to answer any questions from a planning perspective or processing that this um, generate. Any comments? Um, yeah. Hello, yeah, now I'm just trying to unmute myself and sometimes my touch screen doesn't work very well. I apologize for that. Um, Mr. Worley, it sounds as though what you're, these issues are going to come up. There are other issues that I also have questions on regarding the uh, subdivision itself, the proposed plat itself. Do you recommend that we postpone even asking those questions until such time that this comes back, or should we get them out in the open now? I think it's perfectly fine to get those questions out in the open now. We will strive to have answers for you. If it's something that I can answer immediately, I'll try, but it may be just hearing those questions regarding the subdivision layout or design uh, will give us more to work with as we move forward with the airport concerns. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Go ahead, Tom. Um, there's a couple of issues that I have with this particular project that I'm, I'm 
wondering about. I don't know, uh, how does the general plan sit, sit with this particular subdivision, this particular proposed plaque? I mean, is it consistent with the general plan? A determination was made that the Deepwell Master Plan was consistent with the general plan at the time the master plan was approved. That was a determination made by the city council at that time. So from staff's perspective, residential or other non-residential development here would be considered compatible with the general plan. Thank you for that. And uh, what about surrounding densities and proposed densities? Are they consistent with what's being proposed here? Uh, the units per acre, the 4.1 units per acre, is consistent with the already existing development in Antelope Crossings and Westwood subdivision, which have already been approved. I'm going to go back and use one of Robin's maps. This area is Antelope Crossings, and north is kind of that direction. Um, that's Westwood subdivision. The lots there are slightly larger than the lots in <coughs> Antelope Crossings. But the proposed development has a very similar lot size and arrangement. Uh, again, I mentioned the number of cul-de-sacs on the west edge is unusual. But other than that, it's pretty standard for the development we've seen in Deepwell Ranch so far. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And I would reiterate with uh, Commissioner Gamboji, I think, asked the question of getting a more accurate depiction of where that blue intersects with this subdivision. But uh, that will probably come with the tabling this and hopefully seeing it back in a, in a few months shortly. So one of the things that we can do, um, as Robin mentioned in her presentation, the, the um, city is studying the noise contours as well. Being able to see those noise contours along with the impact zones together are necessary to determine <coughs> compatibility. So we will be able to have this layout with both the new noise contours as well as the impact zones indicated on it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Tom, did you have a? Yeah, I have a question. I think it's a legal question, George. We, we have a legal person here. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, as, as a, at a macro level, is it irresponsible for this body and perhaps the city to allow building houses at the end of a very active runway that's gonna be more active and have bigger and bigger stuff coming in and out. So we, it's, a, it's the foreseeability question. There's, we know there's impacts in the airline, airplane business hmm, on both landing and takeoff. Um, there's mitigation in, in place. We're, we're studying all the other elements of it. But as a, at a macro level, does it make sense? Would a reasonable, prudent person build houses at the end of a, a runway? So I'm uh, Chris Rosaire, assistant city attorney for City of Prescott, um, and I'm going to give you a great legal answer here. It depends. So uh, when we <laughs> when we go and look at all the stuff that uh, Robin uh, yes, and I'll that. review all the things that are going to be coming in, that's one of the things that the legal department is going to be able to do. Uh, wow. We're going to be able to look over that and determine, you know, what uh, in a legal perspective is you know, something the city's worth taking a risk on or if it's a risk at all. So at this point, I'm not going to be able to tell you yes or no, but I'm going to tell you a good, it depends. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful answer. And that, that may be almost a philosophical question rather than a legal one. Well, definitely, well, to me, it appears that we have a lot more information we need to obtain before we can really proceed on this particular applicant there. I will point out, Mr. Chairman, we do have a representative of the applicant here who we haven't heard from yet, and he may or may not be able to or want to talk specifically to any of the information that's come up. But uh, we do have Dwayne Hun, who represents Ash Dorn, here, and you may want to call him up and, and ask if he has any responses today or if this is something that they will have to study as well. Would you like to come up, sir? Sure. We're friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Michael Min and members of the commission, my name is Dwayne Hun with Dorn Homes. I think you know our address, 600 West Gurley Street. Uh, obviously, Dorn Homes has been in this uh, city for many years, and we consider ourselves uh, 
we have the same goals that the city has and the citizens have. So we certainly don't want to do anything that's going to harm the airport. That said, we bought property that we, within a master plan community that was zoned, we thought we had the ability to come and develop that. So we're obviously disappointed with uh, some of the concerns that's being raised and some of these are a little bit new to us. So it's hard to respond to all of those. And I'm certainly no expert on uh, airport issues. I'm a, I'm a dirt and concrete guy. So that's what I, I build land subdivisions. So that's my expertise. But I, I will say um, there are a few things that it's worth noting. There was the uh, splay line that's been talked about. We use specifically to make sure all the lots were outside of that. And I believe we actually did la label that on the on the second pages of the preliminary plat. Uh, so, and we also z labeled the zone four and zone six on there. So I, I do think that is on the preliminary plat already. I think you've only seen the cover sheet with the presentation. A uh, couple other things. Um, a lot of these issues are bigger than just what this project is about. It's it's something that really needs to be addressed with the master plan of Deepwell Ranch. And so that we, we're certainly not the representatives of that uh, larger picture totally. We're certainly a big player and committed to being uh, the primary builder in there and uh, look forward to getting these issues resolved so we can move forward. I, do, I will tell you that we have submitted um, 11 different points to the FAA in, in going back and forth with them. Uh, within the subdivision, four of those, I'm sorry, now six of those came back with a finding of no obstruction. Uh, there was a couple that they want us to give a survey, uh, a, a surveyor's certificate, certificate with, a, with a surveyor's license on it to state that we won't build above a certain level and then they would be uh, finding them no obstruction. And there's two areas where they've asked us to uh, lower the top of the house. So we are in the process of redesigning the grading in order to do that. So we have been actively working with the FAA through the uh, Form 7460 process. Uh, and again, those were, those did, that came up in the comments that we got from the preliminary plat review from staff from the airport. And it did note that those needed to be completed before construction. So we have been working on solving those and didn't realize we needed to have it completely solved for a preliminary plat approval. So there's certainly plenty of time in the final design process to work out the details and potentially lower the design as needed of the subdivision without changing the layout in any way. Just wanted to make sure you're aware of those those comments, those, those uh, items. But we uh, we uh, are going to be satisfied with whatever, whatever your wisdom is on this on this matter, and, and we will actively work with the airport to resolve all these issues. Okay. And look you, forward to moving forward. Any questions of the applicant while he's here? Uh, it, it, it's hardly a question. Um, clearly, there'll be a lot of traffic. Where do you see that traffic? Dumping out on onto onto Willow Creek or onto Pioneer Parkway or, or all of the above. Well, it all feeds down Jenna Lane to Willow Creek. To Willow Creek. Yeah, there's no direct connection from this development to Pioneer Parkway. So, It'd so Willow, Willow, Willow Creek, Creek and Pioneer Parkway is going to be the the major intersection where that traffic would. Again, I'm we're develop, we're the developers of this parcel. There's a larger uh, development in play with Jenna Lane with with a. Other uh, for rent project uh, for housing and for other retail uses that I believe there's going to be a traffic signal at the intersection of Jenna and Willow Creek. But I'm, we're not directly involved in that. Maybe staff can speak to that. In answer to the question, all of the traffic from this subdivision will eventually hit Willow Creek Road either north of this subdivision or south of this subdivision and either go north or south on Willow Creek Road. Yeah, my concern is we already have a problem that we are aware of. South of Pioneer Parkway, yeah. certainly. That this, this will not help. Tom Riley, do you have a question to the applicant? <clears throat> no, sir, I do not. I do have other questions, though, but none of the applicant. Thank you. Okay. I, I have a few questions. Ed? Unrelated to the airport. Mm -hmm. When you're calculating lot size, this is where I, I was going through the math and I was, I was struggling. 
Uh, do you take the 87 acres and subtract from it the 26 uh, open space and then divide by the 359 units? Um, lots, lots, you're saying lot size is 5170 square feet to 6690 square feet. Now, you got a pay, you got a page back here that gives every lot size that only Tom Hutchinson can read. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, those numbers are all smaller than your 5170 to 6690 um, numbers. So I'm trying to get an idea how you came up with lot size. Uh, Chairman Michael Michael Michaelman, excuse me, and commissioners, I I think it's important to understand that we see this is a large project and we see three different product lines in there. There, there are uh, 47 by 110 lots, there are 58 by 125 lots, and there are 45 by 88 lots. And so eat, those represent the three units that we have identified. Mm -hmm. And we will build those three units uh, you know, in phases, uh, not phases of each other, but phases of those units so that we can bring three different product lines on at once so that we can meet the demands of the market from the different different levels of income and ability to buy a home. So there are multiple lot sizes within the subdivision, and we've tried to give information on those three different lot sizes, and maybe we haven't been thorough enough on that uh, in this document. But, uh, Approximately what size house would you put on a lot this size? Well, the 58 by 125s are, are we're bringing the Westwood product that you, you're probably already very familiar with that we have on the, the smaller of the two lot sizes in Westwood. And, and what it's is the same that? lot size, 58 by 125. The, oh, you mean the square house, footages? Square footage of the house, yeah. I knew I'd, I knew I'd get caught with that one. I'm, I'm the land guy, remember, so I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but I know that uh, it, it ranges in the you know 1,500 to 2,200 square feet. 2,200 will fit on the. For the larger, for the largest lots. Now, a uh, uh, question related to the airport. Um, why would anybody want to buy a lot or a house at the end of a runway? I think that gets back to that philosophical point was, that was being asked earlier. So I, you'd be surprised how many people do, are not bothered by it. We do have people that when we make them aware in the sales process that we remind them of the vicinity of the airport, they do make the decision not to buy a house in there. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who obviously do want to live there and, and are not concerned with the vicinity to the airport. So you're saying some people say, I don't want to live near an airport, and some people say, I'm okay with it? Sometimes we hear that uh, it's the sound of freedom comment from people. <laughs> so okay, thank you. We've all heard that. Other questions? Butch. Yeah, I've got a question. Now, you do sound abatement in these houses you're, you build, correct? Most definitely. More so than you would on a normal or a different, different area. Yes. How does that actually work? I mean, how does it affect? What, do you, any idea what the decibels level is inside the house? Again, I'm going to bring a vertical guy with me next time <laughs> so I can answer these questions, sir. Uh, you know, it really comes down to the windows and the doors and then the different ratings that I understand as, again, I'm the I understand, the but yourself, you've, you've been in these, these homes, I, I assume. Do you hear that? Do you hear the big plane take off? It makes off? a big difference. It does make a big difference. If, I mean, we don't, you'd have to have a house there that was not equipped with this yeah. to hear the difference, obviously. But Unless it's summertime and you have the screens open. Right. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody from the public like to make a comment? Okay. Tom Riley, did you want to make have some more questions you want to ask before we proceed on this? Um, no. Okay. Um, you want in, in offer to Commissioner Riley and any of you, if you have more questions that are associated with the design or layout of the subdivision, feel free to get them to me. If it's something I can answer prior to getting the information relating to the airport, 
together, I will answer them immediately. And if it's something that requires noise contours and impact zone information and some of the other things that Robin talked about, we will defer those and I'll let you know that we're deferring those. So go ahead and send questions to us and we'll try and get you answers now. Will we be able to get a copy of what Robin presented on the slides? I can provide the copy of the entire slide presentation to you, which includes the slides she has. George, can you send one to me too? Oh, absolutely, yeah. George, could you go back to the slide with the recommended motion? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So in regard to that motion, staff considered setting it out a certain distance into the future because often we will table an item with a date certain. We're tabling it today, it'll be back on July 12th. Um, in this particular case, because we don't know how much time is necessary to get the information that Robin talked about from the FAA, from her studies, or from the applicants, we've proposed this um, recommendation um, instead. And I think it'd be good that the applicant has a chance to get all the information and be able to see if that has any effect or not on that. Okay. Is there a motion to be made? I'd make the motion. I'd so moved. I can't read the whole thing. Uh, move to table PLN 21-007, preliminary plat of the South Ranch at Deepwell Ranch, Units 1, 2, and 3, until such time as the outstanding issues of the airport concern have been addressed. And that was Tom Riley for the record there. We have a motion. Sorry, there... Tom Riley. That's okay, Tom. We have a motion. Is there a second? Yeah, Butch Tracy. Not seconded. All right. Sorry. We have a motion and seconded. Any further discussion? I do have a comment that things that are items that we should uh, take into consideration. So... With the in, in reference to the until such time, um, I would just like all for us and the staff to understand that when I view that, I'd least like to have the airport overlay, the airspace analysis, contour analysis, and the land development code analysis complete before we bring it back to even the preliminary plat back to this board or commission. I'm seeing nods from staff. So I think we can we can include that as a recommendation in the minutes. It doesn't really affect the motion itself, so there's no amendment necessary, but we'll reflect that list in the minutes. Okay. Thanks, George. Any other discussion? Kaylee, would you call roll? Butch Tracy. Approve. Tom Riley. Approve. Tom Hutchison. I approve. Susan Graham. Approved. Stan Goligoski. Approved. Ted Gamboji. Approved. Don Michaelman. Approved. The motion passes unanimously. Okay. Any staff updates? Other than the announcement that we're, we're going to be starting uh, work on our general plan update in the near future, and you'll be seeing this airport overlay uh, coming before you before long as well. Okay. All righty. Then we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for attending. But before